I bring greetings from Amrita Vishwa Vidya Petam, under which there is Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, where I'm working currently. I head the Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, and uh, I'm very closely involved, especially with the Poison Control Center attached to this department, which also has an analytical toxicology laboratory. I'm very happy to inform you that Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences, the in, in fact, the university itself, Amrita University, has very recently been graded NAC A double plus. NAC is, of course, National Assessment and Accreditation Council. And uh, this is the highest grade offered to universities in India. We belong now to the handful of uh, institutes and universities with this kind of grade. And I feel proud to be part of this uni university, which has been doing excellent uh, you know, work, especially in teaching, research, and care of patients. So that is uh, some you know, good news that I would like to convey right at the beginning. Now, with regard to the Department of Forensic Medicine and Toxicology, this is a kind of bird's eye view, which is uh, part of the Amrita School of Medicine, which in turn is part of the Amrita Institute of Medical Sciences. So we have all the components in place, forensic pathology, clinical forensic medicine, and toxicology. I will be concentrating, of course, for this lecture on the Poison Control Center, which is a toxicology component of the department, which has a poison information unit and an analytical toxicology laboratory. The poison information service is 24 hours, while the analytical toxicology laboratory is mainly a clinical laboratory undertaking analysis of samples from living victims of poisoning for better management. I'm pleased to inform you that we are in our 18th year of uninterrupted WHO listing of our center in the global directory of poison control centers. We began in 2003. And uh, we are also in the 13th year of uninterrupted NABL accreditation of our analytical toxicology laboratory. You may be shocked to learn that most toxicology laboratories in India, unfortunately, are not accredited. I'm not talking about the forensic science laboratories. I'm happy to inform you that many of them are going for NABL accreditation, but unfortunately, toxicology laboratories that cater to living victims, what we refer to as clinical toxicology laboratories, first of all, they are very scarce in India, and the few that are there, unfortunately, have not yet got NABL accreditation, which I think is very important because that will be something like a, a check, a kind of monitor for the quality of work being done by the laboratory, extremely important, as you will understand, in uh, toxicology. All right. Our poison information unit, as I said, works 24-7 and uh, utilizes some very good databases on toxicology that are internationally you know, approved like ToxBase from UK and Toxins from New Zealand. The analytical toxicology laboratory is well equipped and we offer, as I've already mentioned, toxicology services to doctors and hospitals and even laypersons, not only of Kerala state, but also elsewhere. We have, whether believed or not, undertaken analysis of you know, uh, samples for poisons, chemicals, etc from patients across India, right up to Kashmir. So that cliche, you know, Kashmir to Kanyakumari is holds quite true for our laboratory. We have even received samples from as far away as Kashmir. And of course we do receive samples from many other states. That is all by way of introduction because time is short. So we will go to the topic for the day and that is how do you frame opinion in a poisoning case without creating controversy, confusion or chaos. Medical toxicology, I'm happy to see, is now developing rapidly, which was neglected for a long time. When I started work in this field, the neglect was terrible. But of late, more and more of my own colleagues from forensic medicine as well as clinical colleagues have begun to realize the importance of medical toxicology, especially when you consider 
you know, the situation in India, we had the dubious, dubious distinction of, um, you know, having the highest incidence of poisoning in the world. And that is not a distinction that uh, anybody should be proud of. It is something that we should hang our heads in shame. And this is holds true with both morbidity and mortality. In order to bring down this kind of terrible statistic, we need to have, first of all, methods of accurate diagnosis in place, which can lead to effective management and thereby minimize morbidity and mortality. That is, of course, clinical toxicology. And as far as forensic toxicology is concerned, if you make uh, you know diagnosis accurate and uh, help the police in uh, forensic you know, cases of poisoning, then you can greatly improve the scenario with regard to toxicological crimes. And uh, for both clinical and forensic toxicology, of course, the common denominator is a correct opinion issued by the doctor concerned or the forensic professional concerned in a particular case. If a correct opinion is not furnished, it defeats the very purpose. And in a clinical case, it can lead to a lot of problems for the patient. And in a forensic case, it can lead to miscarriage of justice. So you will understand the importance of proper framing of opinion in a poisoning case. Let us, first of all, be very clear that it is not always the issue that correct opinion is difficult to furnish in a poisoning case because there are a variety of you know, kinds of poisoning cases and some of them are fairly simple to elucidate and to opine. Whether it's a case that comes to the ER emergency room, a living victim, or whether it's a case brought to a mortuary for autopsy that's a dead victim, you have four kinds of poisoning cases, simple, complex, unclear, doubtful. Depending on which category, a particular case falls under, you will have either ease or difficulty in opining with regard to the cause of death or cause of you know, the poisoning in that case. If it is a simple case, I don't think there should be much of a problem because when I say simple poisoning case, it means most probably these features are present. There is a reliable history. There may be expected signs and symptoms which are quite clear cut. The course of progression or uh, unfortunately in some cases deterioration is however expected or on expected lines. Laboratory findings are mostly consistent with what you expect and the response to recommended treatment is also what you would expect. As you can see, everything is straightforward which is what we call a simple poisoning case, textbook picture of poisoning. So opining should not be a problem at all. If it is a clinical case, you say condition of the patient is due to so-and-so poisoning or overdose, as simple as that. And if it is a case of fatality, the doctor says cause of death is due to so-and-so poison or so-and-so kind of overdose. He can be very categorical. Now, you will notice here I'm not speaking about toxicological analysis. I feel toxicological analysis is being given too much importance in India. One of the reasons why we end up giving wrong opinions in cases of poisoning, because this is instilled in us, doctors, that the reporting is the most important aspect of a poisoning case. Not true at all. Please Understand, I have been in this field, analytical toxicology, for the last, as I've already you know, indicated to you, in close to 20 years. And I can tell you for sure that analytical toxicology is not the be-all and end-all with regard to diagnosis of poisoning, whether it's a living case or a dead case. Toxicological analysis is only supplementary. And sometimes, you may have to, in fact, ignore the toxicological report and give your opinion with conviction based on reliable history, symptomatology, laboratory findings when the person was still alive, and what was the recommended treatment and whether the person responded to that or not. Have your courage enough conviction to state 
firmly in a court of law, if it is a forensic case, or to the authorities concerned that this is in fact a case of throwing the poisoning. Toxicological analysis may or may not support it for various reasons. This is not the forum for me to go into the issues of uh, erroneous toxicology reports. The reasons can be many, and we need to understand that, that toxicology reporting is, uh, is unfortunately associated with a lot of um, loopholes, a lot of um, lacunae that can you know, occur, that, that can vitiate the findings. So do not go by a toxicology report for your final opinion uh, without looking at the overall picture. Please look at the overall picture right from history to conclusion. So I'll give you examples in order to exemplify what I'm saying. It's always good, isn't it, to have examples. So I'll give you two consistent examples for all the four categories of poisoning. One is to do with datura poisoning in a child, and the other, as we'll see later, is an overdose case, paracetamol overdose in a young adult. We'll come to that example later in this category of simple poisoning. Now, when you are talking about simple poisoning, datura poisoning in a child, this is what most probably you will expect. There is a reliable history of a child who was playing close to you know, an area where there are datura plants. The child comes down with the uh, poisoning and the signs and symptoms fit into the anticholinergic toxidrome, which you expect in a case of datura poisoning. In this particular case, unfortunately, there was steady deterioration, even though standard treatment was given and the child appeared to be responding. Investigations, laboratory findings are also con you know, quite consistent with what you would expect in a case of datura poisoning, even if they are not really specific for datura. So there's nothing here to create any kind of conflict. So what is the opinion? Very simple. If it is a clinical case, you write condition is due to datura poisoning. If it's a forensic case, that is a case of autopsy, you write cause of death is due to datura poisoning. As simple as that. Of course, you can wait for the toxicology report, but as I said, do not go entirely by what is mentioned in the report for various reasons. Most probably, however, if you have access to a clinical toxicology laboratory, you will find that um, the laboratory may be able to detect the belladonna alkaloids, as we say, present in datura. At least atropine or uh, scopolamine may be detected. And if it's a forensic case, chemical analysis may reveal the presence of these alkaloids. All right, moving on to the second example, and that is a paracetamol overdose in a young adult. If it's a simple case of poisoning, then you would expect something like this. Reliable history of depression in the patient, which leads him to you know, take an overdose of his tablets and symptomatology. There is an initial gastrointestinal phase followed by liver failure, which is also expected. Unfortunately, in this particular case, there was deterioration, even though the treatment was uh, done properly and the patient appeared to be responding initially to the antidote, and that is N-acetylcysteine. And investigations lab findings also were quite consistent. Even the nomogram, what we call the Drumac Matthew nomogram, also is consistent with paracetamol overdose. Everything fits. So the opinion is simple. Like in the case of datura poisoning, the first example, you can say condition is due to paracetamol overdose. You can supplement it with toxicological analysis, if available. And if it's a forensic case, cause of death is due to paracetamol overdose. If there are consistent autopsy findings, especially with regard to the liver damage, then that is even better. So as you can see, simple poisoning is not really a problem. The problem arises when it is a complex poisoning case. And when I say complex poisoning, it may be uh, a poison which has got unpredictable kinds of features or very insidious you know, kinds of features, or it could be multiple poisons which have been ingested or the person has been exposed to what we call multi-drug you know, overdose or multi-poison ingestion. So these are all complex poisoning cases and you may get features like this. History itself may not be very reliable. It may be available, but you're not very sure. 
there are uh, signs and symptoms, but some of them at least are not very, you know, characteristic of the kind of poison you are suspecting. And the course of progression or deterioration may not also be, you know, along expected lines. Laboratory findings may not be very consistent with what you feel, you know, you should be seeing. And uh, recommended treatment is also not very effective. So any or all of this may be present in a complex poisoning case and naturally, opinion can become a little bit of a problem. And this is how I would suggest that you opine. If it's a clinical case, be honest. You're not very clear. So you say undiagnosed or firm diagnose, diagnosis cannot be arrived at. And if it's a forensic case, again, you have to be honest and say cause of death is unclear or could not be confirmed. This is, of course, uh, without the toxicological analysis being considered. So when I give you examples, we look at that. The same examples, example one, datura poisoning in a child and in a complex case, this is what perhaps you would expect. Child was at home all day, not really having access to the datura plant. But of course, the history, as I said, may not be reliable. Maybe that the child was outside for some time. We don't know. And then the signs and symptoms are present, but they don't all conform to an anticholinergic toxidrome. Some of them may be, but not all. And there is steady deterioration, as in this particular case example. And uh, the investigations, lab findings, mostly inconsistent or kind of mixed picture and treatment, not very good response to standard treatment. And the child has, in this particular example, the child has died. So when you come to opinion, you have to be very careful. This is what I would suggest. In a clinical case, you can write, diagnosis of datura poisoning is not confirmed. But you can say, it could be. I'm not ruling it out. There's no harm in saying that. If you have access to a clinical toxicology laboratory, which is unfortunately not very common in India, but if you do have access, then certainly you can subject the body fluid samples like blood and urine for datura alkaloids. And if they come as positive for any one of them or all of them, like atropine or scopolamine or hyosamine, then that's fine. You can alter the diagnosis a little bit there and say the diagnosis of datura poisoning is now confirmed because uh, even though the characteristic textbook features may not be present, um, more or less it fits into the picture of datura and that is confirmed by toxicological analysis. Now, if it's a forensic case, you have to be even more careful when you come to the opinion. So I would suggest you can write cause of death is not due to datura poisoning if chemical analysis does not reveal the presence of datura alkaloids in the presence of such a confusing picture, right from history to treatment, you know, everything is very confusing. So you can, if you would like, write it like that, or if you want to be cautious, you can write cause of death is unclear or could not be confirmed. It depends upon the doctor concern. So how sure is, is he? It is not that, you know, the same kind of uh, thing should be displayed by all doctors. That is, again, uh, a common myth. It depends upon you. How convinced are you? It depends upon the doctor. How good is he at, uh, you know, interpreting? So you can be a little flexible with your diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And if chemical analysis has revealed the presence of datura alkaloids, then you can write cause of death is consistent with datura poisoning or inconsistent. Again, it depends upon you. Suppose, you know, the laboratory has detected, detected the presence of datura alkaloids, but has not come up with the concentrations in various body fluids and tissues. You do not know because if traces of these alkaloids can be picked up even in a person who is not seriously exposed to any of these alkaloids, especially with high end instrumentation, like you use the LCMS or GCMS or whatever, you may be able to pick up traces, but that does not really mean that the cause of death is really due to that. I hope you understand. So you have to use a little bit of discretion and caution and use expressions like consistent or inconsistent with. Again, I would like to stress that even though you may have opined like this, you can always clarify if the police come back to you, if it's a forensic case, and they ask some questions, don't say that I've already given the opinion and I'm not going to alter it, I'm not going to give you anything more. That is all you know, indicative of a doctor who is uh, not you know, cooperative and not really working in the interest of justice. You need to be accommodative. 
It is not that you're changing your opinion. You can clarify and sometimes you can say that the original opinion that I've given may have to be interpreted as follows. And what you know you are indicating is that the original interpretation may not actually be what it is. So there's a lot of lot of things involved here. I understand that in a forensic case, a doctor is working in the interest of justice. Justice is supreme. The doctor's ego is not important. The doctor's attitude is not important. And if the doctor is not very you know, experienced or competent or knowledgeable, you should not let any of this come in the way of administering justice. Complete honesty is what is important. And believe me, in a court of law, and even with regard to police, they always respect a doctor who is honest, much more than somebody who indulges in a lot of bluff and bluster and tries to indicate you know, that he is right, even though everything indicates that he is wrong. Now we will move on to the second example of the same complex you know, kind of poisoning that is paracetamol overdose in a young adult. And these may be the features with regard to complex poisoning. Patient was not depressed, but parents say that several strips of paracetamol missing from the medicine camp. They do not know for sure whether the patient has taken. And then you know, the signs and symptoms may be present, but they don't all conform to paracetamol overdose. In this particular example, there was steady deterioration and uh, the rumac Matthew nomogram did not really indicate uh, liver uh, you know, dysfunction that is going to happen. And even uh, with regard to the liver function itself, when you run the test, you find that either they are normal or slightly deranged only. And the standard treatment employing NAC, that is NS style cysteine, there was not really the kind of expected response. So whole thing is confusing. Again, let me emphasize, I'm not saying that this kind of picture cannot happen in paracetamol overdose. The, the, the kind of situation that you encounter in poisoning cases is a dynamic you know, kind of scenario. It is not always what you would read in a textbook. Practical thing is completely different. So you have to understand sometimes what is mentioned in the textbook, you may not see in a patient, and yet actually it may be a case of paracetamol overdose. But for all practical purposes here, it looks like it's not fitting. So opinion, you have to be careful. In a clinical situation, you can say, unlikely to be paracetamol overdose because nothing is fitting here. However, if some of these features that I've described, there is you know, kind of a consistency with paracetamol, you can alter that opinion a little bit. I told you flexibility is a key. Do not be dogmatic. That's the most important thing in opinion. Dogmatic doctor is a very dangerous doctor. And with regard to forensic cases, cause of death you can write, not due to paracetamol overdose, if the chemical analysis also does not reveal the presence of paracetamol, and you have the other features you know, described here, you can be categorical or you can be cautious again and say that you're not very sure. Then you, if, if a chemical analysis does reveal the presence of paracetamol, you can write the cause of death as consistent with, or inconsistent also is possible, especially if the concentration of paracetamol is not mentioned in the chemical analysis report. After all, paracetamol is a very common drug and it can be present in a person and may not really be responsible for his death at all. You cannot be sure. So unless the concentration is mentioned and the report clearly mentions that this is a toxic you know, kind of concentration, you should be careful again while appointing. Mere presence of paracetamol is not enough. The concentration is important. So if that is also you know, mentioned in the report and it looks like toxic, as per literature, then you can certainly say consistent with paracetamol overdose. All right, we will move on to example now for the category number three, unclear poisoning case. When you say unclear, it means that the doctor concerned is quite certain that it is a case of poisoning, but he is not very clear as to what kind of poisoning is it, the nature of poisoning. That is because perhaps the history itself is doubtful and the you know, signs and symptoms are a mixture of the expected and unexpected with regard to a particular case and a poison that is being suspected. And the course of progression deterioration is also not very consistent with what we would expect. There are mixed laboratory findings and response to recommended treatment is also not as what you would expect or what is mentioned in textbooks. So whole thing is unclear here. 
you know that it is most probably a case of poisoning, you know most probably it is so and so poison, but you are not 100% sure. So how would you opine? You can opine like this. If it is a clinical case, you can write undiagnosed, no problem, be honest if you're not sure. Or you can you know, modify that and say firm diagnosis cannot be arrived at, which leaves a little window there uh, so that if you're asked later as to, could it be so and so poison, you can say, yeah. If you feel that that fits in, you can say, yes, it is possible. So that window of opportunity is left if you use that kind of you know, opinion that is firm diagnosis cannot be arrived at. You are not ruling out anything. With regard to forensic, uh, cases where death has occurred, you can write cause of death is unclear. No problem in writing you know, opinion like this. And I find it strange that some of my colleagues argue, saying that you know this is not the proper opinion, this is not acceptable. I'm, I'm not sure as to what they mean. There is nothing written anywhere as to how do you opine in a post-mortem report or in a clinical you know, a report of a patient. There's nothing hard and fast. It all depends on the impression of the doctor and how he wants to convey that impression to the authorities concerned, whether it is the police or the hospital authorities or the patient's attendants, whatever. You can also write, you know, could not be confirmed. Now let us look at the examples in order to make this very clear. The same examples, that are poisoning in a child, the features in a case like this, complex case, or um, you know the, the the particular category that we are discussing, where we are not sure about the um, nature of poison that is unclear. Features can be like this: child was playing outside, but the datura plants could not be identified in that area. We are not very sure. Signs and symptoms may be present, but they don't all conform to anticholinergic toxidrome. In this particular case, there was steady deterioration. And the investigations, lab findings, nothing really specific for the Torah. There is some maybe disturbance or alteration of findings. And treatment, there is some kind of mixed response to standard treatment. So the whole thing is unclear and uh, not really something that can be certain about. Now, if it's a clinical case, you have this wonderful you know, opportunity of placing a question mark in front of your diagnosis. Query datura poisoning. No harm in writing like that. You're not ruling out datura poisoning. At the same time, you're not confirming it. That's what it means. Now, some doctors may argue that this is a kind of archaic method of writing the diagnosis or a kind of obsolete method. I don't think so. I've come across reports even issued by doctors abroad in the West where they have used this kind of query when they are not very sure as to whether it's a particular case of poisoning or particular case of illness or not. So that definitely is pertinent. Now, in a case of forensic you know, um, situation, you can't really put a question mark like that. That is not acceptable. So you'll have to be a little bit more clear than that to help the police. So you've got some options. You can write cause of death is not due to datura poisoning if chemical analysis does not reveal the presence of datura alkaloids and you have these kinds of you know, very confusing and uncertain picture. Or you can write cause of death is unclear, could not be confirmed. It depends upon your judgment as to how you want to go. You want to be categorical or you want to be cautious. And if it is uh, a case where the chemical analysis reveal the presence of datura alkaloids in the body fluids or tissues, you can write cause of death is consistent. And if you know, the concentration is not mentioned, you're not very sure whether this is just an incidental finding, you can write, in fact, inconsistent, because you're not really sure. The whole thing is unclear. And just the presence of trace quantities of datura alkaloids may not mean anything. So it depends on your judgment and how you feel about the case. In the final analysis, please remember that each doctor has got a distinctive kind of attitude. As long as it is not the wrong attitude, if it is the right attitude, there can be variations that is to be expected. And how you justify your stand is what is important for the authorities or for the court of law. So you can use expressions like these. If the concentration is mentioned in the chemical analysis report and it looks like toxic concentrations as per the available literature, certainly you can write cause of death is consistent with datura poisoning. And with regard to the second example, that is 
The same thing, paracetamol overdose in a young adult. These could be the features. Patient says he consumes several tablets, but you know cannot be confirmed. He may be lying. Signs and symptoms do not all conform to paracetamol overdose. There is steady deterioration in this case. And the investigations, again, are confusing. The rheumatic Matthew nomogram may be inconclusive. And the response to treatment also not on unexpected lines. So opinion, just as in the case of Dathura poisoning, you can put a query if it's a clinical case. Query paracetamol overdose, no problem. But forensic, again, on similar lines, you can mention cause of death is not due to paracetamol overdose if chemical analysis does not reveal the presence of paracetamol at all. And you can write the other thing that is cause of death is consistent or inconsistent with paracetamol overdose, depending on the chemical analysis revealing the presence of paracetamol and whether that was quantified or not. So we now move on to the last category and that is doubtful poisoning case. When I say doubtful poisoning case, there is in fact a doubt whether it's a poisoning case at all or not because of the following features. No clear history at all. Absence of specific signs or symptoms. Post of progression deterioration not specific to any poison that you can think of. Laboratory findings are total, you know, kind of potpourri mixture. And uh, supportive measures the patient is responding to and the specific measures could not be undertaken because you are not at all clear as to whether it's a poisoning case at all or not, leave alone the nature of poison. So how do you opine? Be honest again. Honesty is always supreme. Clinical query poisoning, you don't have to mention the nature of poison at all. You can just say you're not even sure whether it's a case of poisoning. And uh, since you don't have a clear-cut diagnosis with regard to illness, then your diagnosis can be query poisoning. And if it is a forensic case, you can write cause of death is unlikely to be poisoning because of the completely you know, confusing picture. And of course, if you have chemical analysis report, then you may have to alter that a little bit. That will be exemplified by these examples. Same thing, Dathura poisoning in a child in the case of doubtful poisoning, this may be what you see. Child's movements prior to illness could not be clarified. There's no you know, information at all. Child may not be in a position to say anything. And uh, the others don't know about the child's movements. And symptoms may be present. Do not conform to any kind of specific poison you can think of. There was steady deterioration in this case. And the investigations lab findings may be deranged, but nothing specific for poisoning. And treatment, no response to standard treatment and the child died due to, and even in spite of uh, supportive measures have been, having been undertaken. So opinion in a clinical scenario, undiagnosed or firm diagnosis cannot be arrived at. You're not even sure that it is a case of poisoning, leave alone datura. And if it's forensic, you can write cause of death is not due to poisoning. The chemical analysis is negative. Or if you're cautious, you can write cause of death is unclear, could not be diagnosed even in the presence of this chemical analysis report, because you cannot really rule out. And if the chemical analysis reveals the presence of non-specific poison or drug or chemical in this era, you can say cause of death is consistent with that or inconsistent with that, depending upon your judgment and how convinced are you. Do remember that if you're not very confident, be humble, exercise humility, and consult some other colleague who may be more experienced. Consult with many colleagues also, no problem, before you finally write out your opinion. There is, I repeat, and this is the bottom line in all these you know, kinds of scenarios, there is no hard and fast rule when it comes to opinion. Your opinion should be such that it is honest, that it is rational, that it is clear, and that it is helpful. If you can do this, then you can be of great benefit to society and to the administration of justice in forensic cases. So do not be dogmatic, do not be egoistic, do not start arguing when you yourself are not very sure. Coming to example two, that is paracetamol overdose in a young adult in this kind of case, again, the whole picture with regard to features, unclear. And so, opinion, same as in the case of Dathra poison, you can put, if it is a clinical case, query paracetamol overdose, if at least some of the features are fitting in, 
Or you can just write query poisoning or query overdose. You're not sure. Don't even have to mention paracetamol. If it's a forensic situation, you can write cause of death is not due to paracetamol overdose. If chemical analysis does not reveal even traces of paracetamol. And if uh, you have a chemical analysis that is positive, then you can write cause of death is consistent with or inconsistent with depending on whether concentration has been mentioned or not in body fluids and tissues. So based on the concentration, you can again opine. So this is how you should proceed with a case of poisoning, whether it is clinical or forensic, whether a living victim or dead victim, whether it is a, a, a clear cut, simple in a poisoning case or complex or unclear or doubtful. So I think I've come to virtually the end of my time. I was given 45 minutes. I started a little late, I think five to 10 minutes. So I'm sure the organizers will understand that. I have concluded our session. And if the audience is interested in knowing more about actual cases, please, their opinions, various kinds of opinions were furnished, then I would recommend you to several textbooks, including mine, my very humble book on textbook of forensic medicine and toxicology, which has now entered the 19th edition and uh, work is in progress for the 20th, which hopefully will be released by the end of this year. One third of this book is on toxicology. And a lot of it is in the form of cases and anecdotes. And if you do not like reading, then maybe you can consider attending our conferences. There is Indian Society of Toxicology, which is holding its 15th conference this year in December in Madurai. I hope to see some of you at least there. Thank you very much for a patient hearing and thank you organizers for this opportunity.